A recurring theme in this series is the creationist's addiction to crafting arguments against well-established scientific principles by hinging their entire case on vague terminology. The problem with this, as we saw in the first two videos, is that unscientific terminology like nothing and disorder are vague and leave the door open to equivocation and goalpost shifting, inevitably leading to massive errors in the creationist's reasoning. A frequently cited example of this is the creationist's misuse of the word information, which results in some common misconceptions. Well, and of course, DNA is all about information. <laughs> Deoxyribonucleic acid. Yes, there we um, go. DNA. Which, which is, of course, the information carrying molecules in our body. Uh, lots and lots of information on those uh, on those molecules. Uh, four different bases within the uh, within the DNA molecule. It's like four letters. Uh, it's like a four-letter alphabet, and the information is contained within those. And the information within DNA obeys the various laws of information science. So if we leave a number of these blank CDs around, uh, if we just leave them there like that, okay. then maybe by the end of the show, one of them will have magically produced a copy of Microsoft Windows on itself that it will just have developed from nothing. Because that's basically what the theory of evolution says. DNA does not intrinsically contain information. While it has been described as the blueprint for an organism, as well as having letters, punctuation, and synonyms like a language system, these are merely analogies to help convey the gist of what DNA is to the general public. There is no codon with the word stop written on it in binary or any other equivalent. This is merely a sequence of molecules that, under the right conditions, will react with other molecules in a specific, predictable way. DNA does not contain information. It contains biochemical potential, and as such is subject to the laws of statistical thermodynamics and biochemistry, not the laws of information. These are not letters that follow someone's instructions. These are nucleic acids that undergo purely physical processes. Their arrangement can be described in terms of information, but that does not make DNA an information system. To understand why, let's apply the creationist reasoning to this mountain. We can argue that the arrangement of atoms that compose it can be expressed in terms of an algorithm that is parameterized by specific rules, namely the laws of physics, and so this mountain intrinsically contains information. It contains the recipe to make a mountain. It's the same flawed reasoning, just at different scales. To be clear, the atoms that compose this mountain can be expressed in terms of information, just as the molecules in DNA can, but that does not mean that either one inherently contains information. Information is a purely mathematical phenomenon that has no physical meaning without a stored medium, be it a hard drive or a piece of paper. So when creationists equivocate the independent assortment of nucleotides with information, they are committing a fallacy of equivocation that allows one to extend the definition of information to include any assortment of smaller components. A much more common and much more frustrating example of nebulous creationist language is when they insist that evolutionary theory predicts a change in kinds, without actually defining what kinds are. This allows them to arbitrarily redefine kinds however convenient, and as I've shown in an earlier video, the definition of kinds can range from subspecies to domain. Even on the rare occasions that creationists do decide to define kinds, they still lack consistency. We would say, as creationists, and we have many creation scientists who've researched this, and for lots of reasons, I would say the kind in Genesis 1 really is more at the family level of classification. For instance, there's one dog kind, there's one cat kind. Even though you have different genera, different species, that would mean, by the way, you didn't need anywhere near the number of animals on the ark as people think. You wouldn't need all the species of dogs, just two. Not all the species of cats, just two. As far as anyone can tell, this standard for kind was selected simply to eliminate the need for millions of animals on Noah's Ark, and in all accounts is completely arbitrary. This classification system doesn't have the hierarchical convenience of Linnaean taxonomy or the quantifiable capabilities of phylogenetic systematics, and thus cannot be used to make predictions. The purpose of any taxonomy, whether it's classifying animals, elements, or even numbers, is to find patterns that can be used to make predictions about future data. Ham's kinds system, on the other hand, is adopted purely for the purpose of fitting his a priori conclusion. 
This system of classification is nothing more than an ad hoc rationalization that tries to defend his sacred texts, and this shows both in its inability to be objectively justified and its self-contradictory nature. Even here, we can see that Ham snuck the entire order of Proboscidea and defined it as the elephant kind, obviously because there are no fewer than five different families of elephant-like creatures that belong to this order, and having ten members of the elephant kind on the Ark would pose logistical issues for Noah and even more credibility issues for Ham. It gets worse, however, as Ham and his contemporaries not only deny that humans belong to the ape family, but also deny that humans even belong to the animal kingdom. I tell you what is real abuse, and I tell you what is inappropriate for children. When you take generations of kids and you teach them, they're just animals. But it gets even worse, because different creationists will define kinds differently. Ray Comfort, an associate and contemporary of Ken Ham's, defines kinds in the following way. It's the dreaded word kind, that archaic word that the dictionary defines as a class or group of individual objects, people, animals, etc., of the same nature or character or classified together because they have traits in common. This definition also fails because it doesn't quantify, as phylogenetic systematics does, the number of common traits versus the number of uncommon traits that would lead to an animal being classified as one kind or another. Using Ray's own definition, I can say that all living organisms are the same kind because they're all made up of atoms. I can simultaneously define a kind as the set of organisms that are similar enough to one another to conceive fertile offspring. Using Comfort's estimate for the number of such sets on the planet today, I can also say that there are 6.5 million different kinds in the world. Yet for some reason, in spite of the fact that Ray's definition offers no viable mechanism for distinguishing between and subsequently counting the number of kinds, he goes on to say this. God didn't have to get today's approximately 6.5 million species to fit into the ark. It means Noah needed only one pair for the canine kind, from which would come all the species of dog, from the Chihuahua to the Great Dane, and one pair for the feline kind, from which would come the domesticated cat and the tiger, etc. So now we're talking just thousands of animals, not millions. How can he tell that there are thousands of kinds if his definition is so vague that it allows one to say that there's anywhere between one kind and 6.5 million kinds? Additionally, it is curious to note that only a month prior to the release of the video containing the clip in which Ray stated that there are thousands rather than millions of kinds, he said this. 1.4 million different kinds of birds, fish, animals, and insects, all with male and female, all reproducing after their own kind. In short, not only is the creationist classification scheme of animals inconsistent with reality, it's not even consistent with itself, and that's the best case scenario. More often than not, creationists will openly admit that there is no objective way to distinguish between one kind of animal and another. How do we define kinds, though? I mean, it, it, it seems like a really vague term. Well, it's very, very clear. We've got the canine kind, coyote, and the domestic dog, you've got the feline kind, the cat, and the uh, tiger, and you've got human kind. It's very, very clear. Right, but how, how do you differentiate between them? What's what's the, what's the scheme? You don't have to, because you've got the Chihuahua and you've got the Great Dane. They're dogs. They're canines. In spite of the fact that the fault lies solely with creationists for using vague terminology to commit fallacies of equivocation and goalpost shifting, they will viciously attack rationalists who use technical language. Don't use those big words. Stay simple for a simple guy like me. Small-minded people are oppressed by small-minded people who use big words. They accuse rationalists of trying to intimidate creationists into submission by using big, scary words, and use this as an excuse not to educate themselves on the sciences that they attack. Creationists, we don't use technical terminology to try to look smart. We use it because it has what your words don't. Precision. And in the quest for knowledge, precision is an absolutely indispensable asset. This is the arrogance of creationism. The belief that you can disprove some of the most robust and convoluted principles in science with nebulous and simple language, and the simultaneous pretension that those of us who use big scary words do so only to impress those who accept modern science, and to intimidate those who don't.